Personally, I would uh, um, check uh, the origins of Kukrao Wendy perhaps to the 1962. Uh, that's when the split between Zapu and Zipra, I mean between Zapu and uh, Zanu happened in 1962. Um, the reason why I personally would uh, center um, the, 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 the origin of Kukrao Wendy in around about 1962 is because um, around about at that time, uh, the issue of, of tribe became even more pronounced than what it was before. Uh, for, for lack of a better word, we probably would say that uh, Zanu, Zanu, Zanu was you know, almost, as it were, you know, founded on, 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 a, on a tribal you know, basis. Under the Central Committee, the High Command, the General Staff, under the Mumbai Zimbabwe, under the Mundo, under the Chimre. But not only that, uh, because of that split and because of the magnification of the of the tribal element. Uh, the Smith regime also exploited that and uh, drove even the feelings of antagonism uh, even further than, than they were before. And so from, from, from there on you will notice that uh, <coughs> even though Zapu had, uh, even in its leadership and even in, 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 in Zipra itself, um, they had uh, a, a fair balance of, of both tribes. Um, Zapu and Zanu eventually became identified along tribal lines. To such an extent that even during the war, uh, a lot of things happened during the war. Uh, we, we, we hear of clashes that happened uh, between Zipa, Zipra and, and, and Zanla uh, when they met. But we also know of our efforts that were made to, 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 to bring together the, 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 the fighting force to create the Zipa. Uh, the Zimbabwe People's Army that uh, res that ended up in, in bloodshed, uh, where a, a, a number of uh, Zipra um, combatants were killed, including my brother, uh, who was also killed in uh, uh, in, in Tanzania um, during that time. So you you had a, a situation where there is a build up, you know, of animosity being magnified uh, by all the issues that are happening. Uh, and because of that, uh, we know that um, eventually, uh, when 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 the when they went to for a negotiation at the, at the Lancaster House, um, they went as a patriotic front, but they came out more divided than ever before. The idea was that they would run the election together, but um, that wasn't the case. Having said that, I would also would like to bring in an element. Uh, of, 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 of the intentions of uh, President Robert Mugabe himself. His desire had always been to have a one-party state. And uh, the presence of, of Zapu actually disturbed those plans. So he went out of his way to make sure that, you know, um, somehow that one-party state was eventually created, which actually it did in 1987. Ikukurawundi was not a program of looking for distance, but it was a, an ethnic a program to cleanse Amandebele. Ngobumkave is quoted, he addresses Chungwiza City, go and wait out as in Gatin is in. As you want to buy it, Lassella want to buy Kuluma Ulim Nessin Debele. So, Mbonanga Zatika Nengi Nengi, Ikukurawundi, it was a tribal program to eliminate Ndebele speaking people. Over even no Sydney Sekere Mai Mabe Mbuzu would say for me a tribal army would because they are loyal. So literally meaning would they are loyal avant version and they are loyal to the government and avant version Ndebele, they are not loyal to the government. So that's why back to Navisans are loyal to the In the course of operations, to our disappointment, some of the zebra elements within the National Army actually deserted during operations and we had the ridiculous position that rather than fighting against the dissidents we were actually facilitating uh, the process of reinforcing them and we found that it was ineffective to use such units and 
We therefore in the end decided to send uh, units of the 5th Brigade. For one, they are loyal to the government, and secondly, they wouldn't desert, and they would see to it that they carry out the task which they have been assigned as successfully as they can. They wouldn't desert because they were mainly ZANU supporters. They are loyal to the government. When the 5th Brigade came to, to Matebele land, okay, even when they were being commissioned, the, 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 the command that they were given, or you know, the, 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 the way that the command was couched, um, the language that it was couched in was a tribalistic language. Okay, uh, Debelez are dissidents, and dissidents must be killed. But we also do know that uh, when the 5th Brigade itself came right down to the ground, uh, in many places, in fact, in all the places in, in Matebele land, part of the story was, you know, we're doing what we, we did to our forefathers. Uh, you know, you, your forefathers, you know, stole our wives, killed, uh, killed our, fa our fathers, and, you know, took our, our cattle. So we are here to revenge. I could go around in four to Ian Zagale, Yenzilla, Eschene, Ezuku, Ugoti Lagatis, Unga Kangela, Abantabas, Abagma Musgraves, the Choroch, Labantabagma Musgraves, Elupan, Inda, and Jessing or Makelwan, Yen Zagal and Gilichene. I was a Choroch, Bang Notches Colo, a Bang Notches Cotuin, Abelupan, Bang Notch Mariva Pinks, a Kanye. So young Kionalan into it was a that program. AI sends you so that you could trace your good to and go to the end So, I'm going to go to the end of the day. I'm going to go to the end of the day. I'm going to go to the end of the day. I'm going to go to the end of the day. I'm going to go to the end of the Avant to Bonki, we have got the first end experience. Direct victims, direct witnesses, Pepele, then Umkabe, Yakumbola, as it shows the evidence. Pepe's a city sting, son, Bazamgo Valuban, Obufaga. So I will get you Avant to Gubonagal Taban to Banjani, Namba Bako and Emma Cotini, Emma Cotini, La Unga Kang, Elabana Bantabas, Palagulaba, Bakanjaba, Kitchen Cotini, we unlock mine. So Bonanga, that is in a palace of that program of say. In today, Isilan de Lelo, exhumations are being done and so forth. Goza goza chincha, e perception yaban. As um, the Matabelian director of Amani Trust, we started to try and engage with um, communities which had suffered a great deal of state organized violence and our route into that. By original training, I'm actually a clinical psychologist. So my original impulse was to train people to counsel victims of torture and organized violence. And we actually had a, a training program in 21 hospitals and clinics in, in Matabili land, north, south, and parts of the Midlands, um, where we started training nurses to recognize what we call somatization of psychological distress, by which I mean, you know, if you're anxious or depressed, very often that you, you will know that you, you can end up with a sore neck, a sore head, a tummy ache. You know, if we get anxious, we get a sore tummy, we get a sore head, these sorts of things. And my feeling was that a lot of people in the health profession weren't picking up that what was lying behind a lot of physical symptoms was actually psychological distress. Anyway, so we started training people in this and also in training them to ask questions about state organized violence, to ask people who were showing signs of anxiety or depression, whether they also had any stage ever been beaten by armed men. Um, and this is how we started to uncover, you know, a great deal of histories of violence, you know, through the clinics. But anyway, one day I was on my way home from Sumbumbumbo Clinic, which is in, in Gwanda, um, when a community elder actually stepped into the road and flagged down our car and said, I, I hear that you're in the clinics asking about um, Hindi. Why don't you speak to us, the traditional leaders? We can tell you about Hindi." So I said, fine, I'll come back in two weeks. You organize a meeting. So we had this meeting then with the, with the elders 
who were very nervous. This was 1998. So it was about 10 years after the end of the, the violence and people were still, you know, very nervous of the state at that stage. Um, well, they still are even now, as we know. Um, and they said, all right, come back in another two weeks and meet the community. So we did that and, and we had a big meeting in a, in a little place called Mapani, which is also in Gwanda district. And about a hundred people showed up at that meeting. This was in 1998. And for people there, this was the first time anyone had ever provided them a space to talk about Kokoro Hindi. Um, and listening to people on this big scale for the first time, as opposed to just with one or two people in a clinic. What really struck me was that one of the big issues for people was what they called the angry dead, um, or this issue of people being buried in the wrong place. So right at that very first community meeting, which we had back in 1998, um, the issue of people being buried in the wrong place was brought to our attention as an organization. And in fact, at this meeting, there was a very brave old lady. She was already old then. She was in her 70s then. She's now in her 90s and still alive. Um, anyway, she was the mother of someone who'd been killed. And, and she spoke out and said um, that her son had actually been murdered on the very tree that we were standing under, that he'd been tied by his feet to that tree and bayoneted and kicked to death and then dragged and buried in the primary school soccer field. Um, so we actually walked with her and she showed us, she said, this is where my son is buried and he'd been killed in an, and buried in an ant bear hole. Um, and immediately it struck me that this was wrong. Um, and, you know, and it also made me feel very disempowered as a psychologist. I kind of thought I can say to her, well, every time you're feeling distressed, tell me and I'll come and empathize, um, or we could dig him out of the field. You know, it was clearly not right for him to, to be buried there. And in fact, the headmaster at the school was shocked. He was a new headmaster, well, in, by which I mean he'd arrived after 1990. And he didn't know there was somebody buried in the school playing field. You know, and, and when the mother said to me, how can I mourn my son when children run on his grave every day, I felt it in my heart, you know, exactly what she was saying. And um, this meant that I, I immediately started getting in touch with the Argentinian Forensic Anthropology team, who I had already met in, in 1996, um, when they'd come out to Zimbabwe to, to do an evaluation on exhumation of human remains uh, on our behalf. And they agreed to come out the following year. So they came out in 1999 and we dug the very first grave we exhumed was Edwell, buried in the school playing field because he was the first grave I'd ever been shown. And the first time any family had said to me, we need our bones back. We can't have our, our human remains here. We can't have our loved one buried in this strange place. So, um, but we actually exhumed several other graves in that same exercise. Um, and it, it just became very apparent to me that there were a lot of people buried in the wrong place in, in, and in places which were offensive, not just to families, but to the extended community. Okay, families don't want their children going to a school where there are human remains buried in the, the playing field. Um, you know, we assumed two people who were buried in handcuffs next to a cattle dip, okay, that same year. Um, and we also exhumed six people who were shot and buried in one grave at Sotezi, okay, which is also in Gwanda. These were all Gwanda exhumations. Um, so, you know, the, the reason that exhumations were needed is, is because the families had not been able to undertake rituals. They'd not been able to do ombuiso, um, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to you that this is an important ceremony, which is supposed to happen a year after somebody's been buried, and you can't do Umbuyiso if you haven't done other rituals, you know, at the time of the original burial, and you can't do Umbuyiso for somebody in a mass grave or in a school playing field. Um, so there were strong cultural reasons for people to have their bones back, and this was the impulse. Uh, for the victims, it is important for me a sentence to avant to. Sitola Ugutula Nyemvago Londo Loza Umuntu. 
ngendlela langamasiko ethu abantu balelahlelo labo ende abantu we connect with the dead ngendlela esibabeke ngayo kulokubeka esintwini kuloku kuloku lahla umuntu oseganyeni ulahliwe yokuthina esintwini sakhe ithu umuntu ume ngafanga ngezihlaka lezimpi ngemva kwesikhathi uyabuyiswa ekhaya kuyisintu sethu ngoba sithi kazi okhangela imuli so laka ithe sibona laba abantu iveni bafa ngendlela ezingandle eba ezimulini ngoba nikukuthula uma sibe chilu dai uba basakhamba samthathe entabeni nje uba basakhamba samthathe ganyene linje simbekile ulele lapha nani labe muli sebe thola ukuthula laye usethola ukuthula ngoba selethwe ngapi ekhaya izinto zonke sezivule also once we started talking to chiefs they spoke to us um, about what they called the bones in the forest um, and they said that every um, late winter and sort of July August every year there are traditional rituals where the traditional leadership will walk through the forest and um, they will look for um, animal bones which are lying on the surface of the ground and and they collect those bones and take them away and bury them because they believe that bones scattered in the forest results in um in in misfortune and droughts and so on the following season but the the bones which they've never been able to do anything about are the human remains so they also had that you know there was a strong cultural impulse from traditional leadership that the bones in the forest needed to be moved One of the reasons I moved from being a clinical psychologist to being a forensic anthropologist, because I now have a master's degree in forensic anthropology, was that I realized to heal the living, we needed to heal the dead. I mean, just to put it in an oversimplistic way. Um, and I realized that from a cultural point of view, particularly in rural areas, people don't necessarily engage with the idea of counseling or with psychological interventions. It's not something which feels culturally appropriate. Um, but, but I found that once we started to talk about the dead, people then engaged in what I would call counseling anyway. Um, because in the process of wanting to learn, you know, because part of the process of exhumation is that we have to gather information about the dead um, and also about how they died. So it became a process of testimony telling um, and counseling, if you like, where families would say, well, this is, you know, this is what happened um, to our beloved person or, or to our multiple family members. And in that process, they would also talk about what happened to themselves. We on that day, we were also beaten or there was mass rape going on. Very often women won't say they were raped, but they would say women in this village were raped or the soldiers were raping the young girls, you know, or whatever it is. So these stories would start to, to come out in the broader context of us wanting to know um, all that we could about the dead, because that's part of the process of exhuming is that you have to know how do we know this person is buried here? Okay, who buried this person here? Um, where is the eyewitness? Where is the person that actually buried this person? Um, and what were the circumstances that led to the death? What is it that actually happened? Because this is forensic information, if you like, that we will then be using um, and taking into account when we do our own analysis of remains and so on. So it becomes this big process of recovery of memory, recovery of history, um, and vindication of eyewitness accounts. And for me, all of this is part of the process of, of healing or of vindication um, uh, for, for that community in, in terms of telling the truth around issues which are maybe still denied or not fully acknowledged, even if they're somehow acknowledged okay, at the national level. What I would like to say is, is that um, one of the things which we know through our documentation of sites of graves for more than 20 years now um, is that the, there was the, the 5th Brigade changed its modus operandi. So it depends what year you're talking about and it depends what district you're talking about in terms of how remains, how people were killed and how they were disposed of because this changed over time. Um, and in 1983, for example, 
which was the first year in which 5th Brigade were deployed on a wide scale. Um, they were active mainly in Matabili Lang North, and this is where most people were killed um, in terms of, of um, those years. And um, basically they did very public murders in the village setting. So there were also other types of killing which went on, but most of it was um, murders in the, in the village setting. And um, what this means is that people know who's buried where. So there's very good documentation around who are in which graves in 1983 in, in, in Matabili Land North. But, you know, 5th Brigade was then um, withdrawn and um, they were redeployed in January, February 1984, this time in Matabili Land South. And their modus operandi was different now. Okay, it, it tended to be to remove people from their villages to 5th Brigade bases where they would then be tortured and killed and they would very often now be clandestinely killed. Um, so in fact, Ed will, was a bit of an anomaly, okay, because he was buried in a school playing field and it was a witness burial and his own mother witnessed where he was buried, okay, because that wasn't usual in 1984. In 1984, people were often taken to camps um, and then buried in the vicinity of those camps. Um, and they were often just disposed of by 5th Brigade in caves, in crevices, things like this. And, and the reason that we know where some of those dead are is that because often the relatives or other people in those camps, once they were released back home, they would go clandestinely into the hills, into the area where they'd last heard gunshots or something like that, and find human remains. And then they would try and secure them, you know, in a cave, putting rocks in front of the cave to prevent scavenging. Um, or somehow marking the site. Um, and so it, it's actually much harder to find the dead from 1984 than from 1983. But um, it's much harder to dig in Matabili Land North um, for political reasons, okay, and precisely because these graves tend to be in very public places. You know, one of the advantages, if you like, of the dead of 1984 is that. Um, because these graves are all off the beaten track, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to involve digging in a public space in order to retrieve the bones, if you like. Kanengi nengi izi mulizi ya wazi abanduba ngabebe njani bebegwe e benga bekuwa ngangenjila ya ababanya ba izi muleza ababega ya kutas babega ngangenjila lenge mkolo zaako. So i mulizi ya wazi tu ubaba umfowe tu umtanami ulele ndawe nenji. So izi mulizi ya wazu utabantubanga. Kutaka ogulu ushupo katezi kutini. Zifisu kutibebewe nye nlela. La nye mkolo la masigo abu. Yiko i exhumation e e e abanjani. Aba ifune la kontai. Sifunu kia yenza imkuba yetu. Sifunu kumtatu mtulo. Simbege nye mkuba yetu. Endawe ni yetu. Esi ketileo njengani. Njenge mwuri. Lapano kwa kutai. Umuntu engaza ke ege lwe sekte geni. Njalwa banyi wa utolugutini. Uya be tetwe lapa wabu lawe le njenge. Enga njenda wene njenge pumula. Lichelo njenge zlobu tayi. Umuntu wana watato wa file nda wene nje. Isa mbega. Lewe se lichelo ngabanya bantu. So izi mwuri kazi patika nga. Egubege wene kwa labo bantu. So imu li zifisu uti ngabe zi apatika. Zibabege ngendi la lange mkolo za. So if you are going to conduct an exhumation. Well the first thing is. This is always community driven. It's always, first of all, driven by the families and secondly, by traditional leadership. And the reason for this is I don't know where graves are for a start or our team doesn't know. And we certainly don't know who's buried where. Okay, this information resides within families and communities. So it absolutely has to start there um, where a family or a, a chief comes to us and says, you know, there's a problem with a grave um, in our area. And, um, you know, if a family comes to us and says, you know, we, we've got a, a, our uncle buried in an ant bear hole, you know, whatever it is, um, we will then go to that family. And, and the first thing we ask is, did you bury him? Um, and if the family says, no, it was the neighbor, then we say, right, we want to speak to the neighbor. Okay, we don't want hearsay. We want to actually speak to the person who buried because this is your best chance of, of digging up the right site. Okay, because after many years or decades, one ant bear hole looks like another. Um, and so 
you know, we need eyewitness accounts of the actual grave. We'll then go to the grave. We'll take eyewitness records. We'll take the family there and so on. So that we've got, um, and then after that, um, we then want to do what we called what we call pre-mortem data collection. Um, and this means finding out all the information about the dead. Okay, so pre-mortem information is information about how tall was the person when they were alive, how old were they at their time of death, and other information, particularly related to the teeth. Like, was there a missing tooth? Um, you know, what did his teeth look like when he smiled? Do you know, did he have fillings? Do you know, did he have teeth pulled out? And again, the best source of this information will usually be either a mother or a widow, okay? Um, if it's somebody like you, your age, as a young man, um, you may not know if it's your father who's being dug up. You're not going to know if he had missing molars or not, okay? Because you would have been too young when your father died. So for us, it's very important to to try and find those people who remembered him as an adult, which means other adults. It can be siblings, um, brothers and sisters of the deceased, uncles and aunts of the deceased. So, and, and we will often ask more than one person. Other things which can be useful is what clothes was he wearing the day he was taken away? Um, or what personal effects did he have? You know, what did it do? Would you still remember? What was his wedding ring like? Um, you know, sometimes people will say he always wore a copper bangle for his for arthritis or, you know, something like that. So it's, it's a issue of personal effects can be very important um, because we may find these when we exhume and, and that will never be completely a defining factor in terms of identity, but it all helps to build a picture of who might be who in the grave. And it has helped us in the past. We found things like a silver cigarette lighter or a copper bangle um you know particular items of jewelry um or, or personal effects which people recognize uh, of a certain belt buckle you know as we know people in rural areas they might have only one belt and the family might be very familiar with the belt buckle or they might have only one pair of shoes so all of these things can help in, in terms of of um identity so, but it's very important to get that information prior to digging, because once you start digging, people then may, um, well, I mean, sometimes something may come back that they've forgotten, but people may also start misremembering, if you like, because they're so very keen to be able to identify this person um, as their relative. So it's important that you do exhaustive interviews before digging. Okay, so we gather all that pre-mortem information and we keep it, um, for the time that we can exhume. And then when we exhume, um, we, exhumation is again a, a very technical process. It's a very professional process. You have to exhume very carefully um, and you have to kind of like dig very carefully down to the level of the bones. And then you would use very small digging instruments, even like dental type tools, paint brushes, tooth brushes, um, little, you know, tiny tools so that you gradually uncover all the remains and expose them without disturbing anything. And this is because you don't want to destroy anything. You don't want to damage a bone um, because post-mortem trauma can mask what we call perimortem trauma, which is trauma from the time of death. Um, and you also don't want to lose anything. There might be bullet cases, for example. Um, there might be other, there might be personal effects which aren't on the body but are in the grave. So you don't want to damage or lose any of that information as you dig. Um, what we also do is, is, because this is about healing, we allow families to undertake rituals at any time that they want. Often they undertake rituals the night before we dig, the morning before we dig. Once we've uncovered all the remains, people very often pray to the deceased and explain to them the process that's going to happen next um, and so on, because it's their last chance to see the remains as they are in the grave. Okay, because of course, once we've removed them, you can't ever reconstruct the event. So um, we then remove the human remains, take them into our offices, um, where we then do an analysis of human remains. We do what's called human profiling, which means that we measure a lot of the bones, we take something like 80 or 90 measurements, and there are 206 bones in, in a full skeleton. Um, and so we inventory all the bones, we note any post-mortem damage 
And we also start looking for what we call perimortem trauma, which means trauma at the time of death. And here we're looking for sharp trauma, blunt trauma, ballistic trauma, um, trauma as, as a result of burning, and also what we might call um, um, post-mortem trauma. So we're looking for healed trauma or maybe even semi-healed trauma. Okay, well, you might have somebody, if they're held in the camp for a while, they might have broken ribs which are starting to heal, um, you know, as a result of, of perhaps assault while in detention. Um, and and that, that those broken bones may already be starting to heal. Okay, so you can tell all of these different types of trauma um, if you are a trained expert and you know what you're looking for. So um, we do a trauma test. We also, we also assess the age of the deceased um, and the sex of the deceased and the ancestry um, of the deceased. Um, although in our context, ancestry is not such a big issue because we assume everybody is, is um, an African black um, or, or Indibeli person. Um, and so those are the norms. So there, there are no norms for bones which have been developed in South Africa. They're none in Zimbabwe. But fortunately for us, there are some South African norms um, which we can use okay, in terms of, of sex and ancestry. Commissioner NPRC Mbwanangazati, Ia fisa ufu sevenza ngoba senge nga ibona ibe kuona kuma exhumations hai tu inge tisile ukubana utlelo loma exhumations ilu pumelele but mbwana ngazati ogunye ogunga nyugea ibamba kakulu i NPRC ngu i politics ye liri kunga ning sicho njalo ngoba uza tuluti is not well resourced so labo aba pete intambu aba pete manla yuguti ogwenza benze njalo uguti zanda za bozi the <laughs> Even in the middle, a promoter would lend to Angie and Zagalai, even corner Imsagas or Ekulumangako, Oval, Gufago, the bending flame, Govlawa, Echo, would in memory of those who died of Kukraon. The 22nd of December, even Lilanga, Elifago on the right narrative, would I, 22 December, is your unit day. Like what the, uh, the agreement says, but 22 December is a day born out of a genocide. So it's the end of genocide today. Kube lila nga lugu kumbulani, ugu miso kwe setlaga lo se kukura honi. Mo 22 December. Ugu zawa lila nga noti ugu koma maretwa nga ma individuals, nga wanti bima tepele. But kube a national day that every Zimbabwe who believes ugu bula wakwa bantu, by the government, irrespective of a tribe or race, was wrong. So, in case you believe, a National Day of Remembering that said chapter. <laughs>